this is an oral history interview with Rob Sweeting. Okay. Rob, thank you for being with us. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. And you, uh, you know, we normally do these interviews when someone has retired. Right. And you're only semi-retired. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but we were glad to go ahead and be able to uh, get you to sit down and uh, talk about your career at WJXT and mm -hmm. before WJXT. Okay. Um, you semi-retired means you're still doing some anchoring. The the term you used uh, in an email to me was anchor emeritus. That's the title. I don't even know what that means. That's a cool <laughs> title. Yeah. But it's a cool title. I've yeah, got emeritus yeah. after a couple of my titles <laughs> yeah. also. Uh, well, let's talk about, uh, go, go back to the beginning, I okay. guess, and uh, were you always interested in broadcasting, or as a boy, if somebody had asked mm -hmm. you that question, what do you want to be when you grow up, what would you have said? I would say if you asked me when I was in even the eighth grade, ninth grade, it's just something I wanted to do. I, uh, I just enjoyed telling a story, telling someone they didn't know, that they, that they didn't know about. I just enjoyed doing that, and I was watching the news, I guess with my mother, at a very young age. And uh, it's just something I, I figured I always wanted to do. And I pursued it when I got in high school. I wrote for my school newspaper. I became the yearbook sports editor. Um, when I went to college, I continued to write for uh, my school newspaper there, everywhere I went. Um, it's just, it's, it's something I always wanted to do, and my mother really wanted me to be a teacher. She just didn't feel that a black person can be on TV at that age. Don't forget, we're talking about 1965, 67. There were not a lot of black people Indeed. on TV. She was, yeah. she was right, in yeah. a way. You know, do you really want to take a chance on doing this? And I didn't see any reason why I couldn't. You know, that's, that's the young naivete in, 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 in all of us sometimes. You know, why can't I be on TV? And on the subject of race, um, you went to uh, all black elementary and middle schools. Yeah. And then participated in, the, uh, in school integration at, in high school. Well, so was, what, what are your reflections on that? It was, it was one of the first class, uh, integrated classes in, in Dade County. Um, Maybe maybe the second integrated class. It was quite an experience, um, an experience in the sense that you're going to school with people you, you see on TV, but you never really had any interaction with. I mean, of course, we know who white people are, but you really didn't interact with them. All our beaches were segregated. Uh, everything was segregated. Uh, and neighborhoods. And were neighborhoods were very segregated. Yeah. I mean, you, you very seldom ventured into uh, a neighborhood that was pr predominantly white. So were you bused for integration? We, we were. We were bused about, I would say, uh, 10 miles, mm -hmm. 10, 10 miles. And it, it was quite an experience. I, I think a, a lot of my classmates were intimidated. I was not. For whatever reason, I just was not. Um, I was there to learn. Um, I just didn't seem to care what these people thought of me because I, I, was, I had confidence in myself. And was there a, any equivalent busing of white kids? No, no, uh, no. We were bus. So. We were bus to their neighborhood. Yeah. So you graduated from uh, Miami Carroll City High School in 1970. The Chiefs. And uh, oh, right. <laughs> and um, then you were figuring out what to do next to embark on your broadcasting career. I did, and I, I uh, you know, we all make mistakes. Um, I think I made a mistake. I, I went to Career Academy School of Broadcasting. Um, I'm still trying to become a news reporter. Mm -hmm. Well, I learned very quickly that that was not going to get me there. It was a school for radio and television, they said, but it was mostly radio. So if you wanted to be a DJ, you would have Oh, been. yeah. <laughs> 15 minutes past yes. the hour, or I'm, you know, that kind of thing. Um, that wasn't it. So I, I went to college, uh, like I should have done from the beginning. Um, and it took me a while to graduate, but I, I finished at Florida Atlantic University in Boca Raton, and that was the best decision I made. Uh, they had a television station there. Um, I wrote for the school newspaper. I worked at a, a public uh, radio station. While you were in college? While I was in college. Oh, I worked my way through college. Yeah. Uh, 
th th those were the days when you know student loans you can only get so many student loans mm -hmm. of course your parents can help you only so much um, so yeah I worked I, I worked a, a number of jobs uh, to make ends meet which I guess after you finished college made it easier because uh, you had a resume mm -hmm. uh, of actually hands-on work in broadcasting experience and my internship I think helped me uh, tremendously I always tell a lot of the uh, young people going into broadcasting, an inter internship is invaluable. It really is, and it helped me tremendously. Um, after my internship, I actually ended up getting a job at the station where I interned. And that ha that does happen. Yeah, uh, yeah. And so that station was WPTV. Okay, in West Palm Beach. In West Palm Beach, uh, it was. Uh, what, were you, what did you do initially? You know, I was uh, a reporter. Uh, and I, I still have pictures of uh, of me with my camera on my camera on my shoulder. That's if I was going to do an interview. I had my bell and howl just for like other video, and uh, you, that was the days. I guess the days when you shot your own video, and you came back and you put the report together. You edited your own tape. And, and by the way, uh, have we come full circle? We have come. I was going to say we have come <laughs> full circle. So many stations today hire these young people who can shoot their own video yeah. and put their own stories together. And I said, wow, mm -hmm. um, I remember doing that, gosh, 30 years ago, mm -hmm. 40 years ago. So, but uh, yeah, that's what I did. I was a reporter. And then I uh, got an opportunity to uh, anchor one of the little cut-ins we used to do in the morning. You know how the day show came on and mm -hmm. then they give you five local stations five minutes to do news. And so I was doing that for a while. And that sort of gave me uh, an interest in, in, in anchoring. Um, but it was only part time, so I moved on. On to WTVT. WTVT Pulse 13 in Tampa. Yeah. That was uh, that was an experience, and and you know what? S speaking of mistakes, like I said, we all make mistakes. I, I think that was a mistake. I, I moved to that station too soon. Uh, at the time, I think it was something like the 17th Market. West Palm Beach at the time was the 80th Market, mm -hmm. so that was a, quite a jump for me. But you know what? It, it wasn't the right move at the right time. I, I could have stayed at WPTV and, and, and honed my skills a little bit more. But uh, I went to Tampa and I ended up shooting my own video again. Mm -hmm. In the 17th market, I didn't think I should do that. But it was um, a bad experience in that I was obviously the only black reporter on staff. and. I was assigned, I guess, a bureau in Bartow. Uh, it just, I did not understand why you would send your only black reporter to Bartow. Uh, it, was, it was an experience that uh, I don't ever want to go through again. I was always the only black person in the room. Um, it was clear that they didn't like me. Um, I've been to Bartow a number of times, and, yeah. <laughs> and even now it's not a great assignment. <laughs> Well, it was just so clear. So it was very difficult to get, get any stories or get anything yeah. done. Um, uh, you could forget about any type of uh, rapport with people. And it had to be a really big story to get on the news. Uh, case, yes, right? exactly. So I finally talked well, talk them into letting me come back to Tampa. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and I think things got a little better when I was uh, in, in Tampa. Mm -hmm. so. uh, next job was back on the East Coast in Miami? Yes, um, after I left Tampa, I was out of work for a while, and uh, I ended up going to Miami, mm -hmm. uh, my hometown. So that was interesting, um, reporting in my own hometown. And it was fast-paced, and I, I thoroughly enjoyed it because it was, it was fast-paced. So comfortable. I, I, I was, yeah. I was, because um, even though at that time uh, the Cuban influx had already begun, mm -hmm. um, I still was home. Um, and that was one of the recurring stories. Yes, uh, you know, I was I was home, but the the Cuban influence down there was so strong at that point. It has only gotten stronger. Um, Cubans and Haitians. And Haitians as well. Um, and one of the things that I covered and I tried to do a fair job of, and that is illustrating the way Haitians were treated versus the way Cubans were treated. And it was so obvious that uh, they, they were not welcome 
the Haitians. And it was just the way they were treated, but they were such a resilient people, uh, a very mild-mannered, resilient kind of uh, person. And I, uh, one of the stories I covered down there uh, involved the Haitians. They, so many Haitians came over in rafts, boats, what have you, but a group of them got lost their way and they ended up in the Bahamas and they were beaten and sent back to Haiti um, and while well, they were on their way to Miami and uh, they sent me down to uh, Port-au-Prince and I, I just felt so bad. You know, you're supposed to keep your feelings in check when you're reporting, sure. but I felt so bad for them. Um, but uh, I, I put my feelings aside and I covered the story. You know, for and this station. was big news in Miami. Yeah. Uh, was it uh, registering on the radar uh, with the network? Were they? Yes, and the only reason it did register because, like I said, they lost their way uh -huh. and they ended up in the Bahamas and they were beaten so badly uh, in the Bahamas and sent back. Um, and that was the story of, of how they were mistreated in the Bahamas while trying to get to the uh, United States. Mm -hmm. So yes, uh, it, 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 it garnered national attention. From Miami to Atlanta? I moved to Atlanta, I did. Um, I anchored some in Miami, mm -hmm. but uh, Atlanta offered me a, a full-time anchor job, reporter anchor. Uh, On WSB? Uh, WSB in uh, Atlanta. And this was about the time that CNN sort of took off and the 24-hour news cycle started. And we were an ABC affiliate. And to try and, I guess, compete with CNN, uh, WSB started an overnight newscast. And I was uh, the first person to anchor that overnight newscast. That's right. When I tell people that, they said, what time are you on now? I said, oh, I start about one. Oh, in the afternoon? Oh, uh, no. <laughs> one o'clock in the yeah. morning. Right. I worked from 11 o'clock um, at night until nine o'clock um, the next morning. And I did- Truly the uh, graveyard. Shift. Yes, yeah. I did 50, a 15 minute newscast every hour. Mm -hmm. um, and then eventually we started doing a half hour newscast and we would tape a half hour and live for a half hour, run the tape for a half hour, live for a half hour, and run a tape of that last hour. And that's how we made it through uh, the morning, but yeah. And uh, CNN, uh, then and mm -hmm. maybe now as well, uh, had a, a real impact. They definitely had an impact on the amount of news that was oh, available. Yeah. Uh, in a 24-hour period. Well, I, I, and you can see that's what happened at WSB. I mean, all of the stations were trying to keep up with this new uh, innovation that Ted Turner came out with, and that is 24-hour news. And we were sitting around saying, you can't have that much news. There's just not enough happening. And <laughs> sure enough, it turns out it is. And if you, uh, if CNN you, was based in Atlanta. Based right? in Atlanta, yeah, it, it was. Um, and I think that's why WSB was trying to come compete with them on, mm -hmm. on a local scale, obviously, because CNN was national, but nonetheless, on a local scale, we actually tried to compete with them. From Atlanta uh, to Jacksonville. Yeah, Atlanta was, was fine. I, I finally got off the graveyard shift mm -hmm. and uh, I... And adjusted your biological uh, clock. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and I started uh, uh, anchoring the new news on the weekend. Mm -hmm. I have to say that slowly to people because they said, Oh, the noon news? Don't no, it's the noon news on Saturday and on Sunday. Yeah, it was one of the first stations that uh, did that. Now a number of stations uh, have noon newscasts and morning newscasts mm -hmm. uh, on the weekend, Saturday and Sunday. Uh, so here we go with that 24-hour news cycle again. Mm -hmm. But uh, I, I I wanted a, a full-time anchor job and reporting, but uh, more of a five-day a week, and um, uh, I had a friend who works here now, uh, and we work together at WSB, she said, well, you know, you ought to call my old boss in Jacksonville. Uh, they may be looking for somebody to do the new news during the week. Mm -hmm. I said, okay, sure, I'll, I'll call. And sure enough, they needed somebody. I came down, I interviewed, I got the job. And I was going to be here, I don't know, three years, two years, get a little experience working full time, and then boom, mm -hmm. I'm out of here. 30 years later. Yes, you're here. Here I am. Yeah. <laughs> Well, and uh, 
what's your, uh, how do you explain that? Well, you know, first of all, um, I had moved a lot uh, during my career so far. And, and after a while, uh, it, it, you begin moving for the sake of moving. Mm -hmm. uh, I, um, I had an excellent opportunity here. Um, I was bringing up my children at, at that point. Uh, so you give them some stability instead of moving. They've already moved them from Miami to Atlanta and now to Jacksonville. Mm -hmm. um, and in addition to that, and, and this is truly the reason why, opportunity after opportunity presented itself here at WJXT. Um, as news, as our newscasts began to expand, uh, I got another opportunity. I've, I first started, I started the first morning show here at WJXT. Um, uh, Glenn Wood and I, um, mm -hmm. uh, Eyewitness News at Breakfast. And, mm -hmm. um, and that morning show led to the noon news in addition to, then we started a five o'clock newscast. And I started that, I think in 1990, 91. Mm -hmm. um, it was uh, Tom, Deborah Giannotis, um, Nancy Rubin, and myself. Mm -hmm. And we uh, did started an hour and a half of news, which at the time just seemed like wow, a lot of news. Because don't forget, we were doing like a half hour news at six, and then CBS News came on. Sure. Well, and, and before that, it was fifteen minutes. Fifteen minutes. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so when we we did that, an hour and a half. Whoa, that's a lot of news. So we brought in, you know, they brought in me, they brought in Nancy, and between the four of us, we did an hour and a half. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that presented an opportunity and I stayed through that and then they decided to expand even more so now you know it was two hours of news so basically uh, you were happy here you weren't I looking, was. You weren't I looking was, for another uh, I was not I, I, I did not I didn't look for another job wow until I guess it was 1998 or something like that and I, I Glad I didn't get it, mm -hmm. to be honest with you, because I was very happy here, very comfortable here. And I was comfortable with the community. I, 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 I liked the community. It wasn't a big city, mm -hmm. but it wasn't a small city either. And there were a lot of things to do um, and in the surrounding areas. It was just a nice place to live. I, uh, I always tell people I compare it to New Orleans in the sense that I love to visit New Orleans. I wouldn't want to visit Jacksonville. But I wouldn't want to stay and live in New Orleans. But I love living here. Mm -hmm. I just think it's a great place to, to live. live. Yeah. Um, you know. But in terms of, if you're a tourist, I don't know. <laughs> and you, uh, for whatever reason, did a lot of reporting as well as anchoring. I did. I did, particularly uh, in uh, from like 1980 all the way to the late 90s. I, I did a lot of reporting. And, and a little bit of anchoring. And then as the years went on, then I sort of was tied to the anchor desk and I got out every few months or so. Mm -hmm. um, but prior to that, I was in the regular rotation of reporters and uh, covered a number of stories, um, so many memorable stories uh, that, that I enjoyed doing. I never, you know, the hard news stories, well, you gotta have that, you have that every day. But then there are the stories that, that just stick in your mind. Mm -hmm. um, some of them, like uh, after I've worked so many places at this point, that the stories were the same. Uh, you know, the, the names may change, the location may change, but then you have that story that just doesn't come along every day. And I think of the how funeral home story. That was a, a, a mortician who had the contract for, with the city of Jacksonville to bury its indigent. And I don't know. He got behind and he started burying bodies in the back of his business, in the back of his junk cars in there. He um, cremated some boxes with no names. And the story finally came to light when someone came for their relative's body, a uh, cremation box. And, oh, yes. <laughs> and, and finally, they, she sort of went to the city. The city then, in turn, did an inspection and that's how they found out that he was he was storing bodies and uh, that was a story that I had not seen anywhere I had traveled and uh, it, it was just a fascinating story it turned out he wasn't a mean guy he was just 
an alcoholic who was in over his head. So uh, it wasn't so much uh, greed, or it was just incompetence? Incompetence. And, yeah. It was that, that, and it, it wasn't greed in the sense because, first of all, the contract didn't play, pay that much yeah. money. He, was, uh, he had a contract to, to bury the indigent. Uh, it, it wasn't like uh, anybody was really going to come look for these people. And, and that's how, it, uh, you know, the story was exposed. Somebody actually came to look for one of these indigent people. But, uh, and this is the kind of story that you would say uh, continued the longstanding tradition at WJXT on investigative reporting. It was. It really was. And then our documentaries were, were uh, very influential and, and, and strong documentaries, mm -hmm. like uh, the, uh, the story we did on roads, um, as Jacksonville, The Deadly Drive Home. We looked at, at uh, our roads and, and the way they're designed and why they're so dangerous. There were so many accidents happening. Uh, the Buckman Bridge at the time was, mm -hmm. was a dangerous place. And one thing that uh, was brought out in that documentary was the Arlington Expressway. Uh, you will not find too many other roadways like that in the country. It was so poorly designed. We brought in uh, state inspectors, uh, state engineers, and even they admitted that it was poorly designed mm -hmm. and it was dangerous. And it was. So many people have uh, lost their lives on that road. And uh, you told me about a story that uh the only time anybody ever uh, pulled a gun on you yeah. in the line of duty. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was that was uh, pretty scary. Um, it, it was the uh, Riverwalk, the South Bank Riverwalk. Mm -hmm. It was for the landscaping, and basically what happened was there was a contractor who was uh, paid a lot of money by the city. I, I, I forgot how much the contract was, but it was uh, way over six figures, maybe a half million, three quarters of a million dollars contract to put in landscaping all along the South Bank Riverwalk. Well, the, the contract calls for maybe crepe myrtles or lantana or whatever. Well, this guy, this contractor, got one of his friends out in Bryceville who had a nursery, and they put in all kinds of plants that the contract didn't come, cheap plants, plants that uh, were dying or dead by the time they put them in, and they cut all enough corners where a pretty good amount of money they were saving and they kept that money. Well, we exposed that, um, and we got a tip from a person who didn't get the contract. And he wanted to let us know that these people were, you know, cutting corners and keeping the money. And so I went out, along with my photographer, Don Flynn, to the contractor's, the subcontractor's house in Bryceville. And we went on to his property. We told him we wanted to talk to him about, you know, the South Bank River walk in the landscaping. And he pulled the gun and told us that we gotta get off of his property. Wow. Um, and I said, you know, we'll leave, but to shoot us, you won't solve any problems <laughs> by shooting us. It will only make it worse. You know, at this point, the, the, he was caught. And I, I don't know, his reaction was a, a bit much. But if there's a manual uh, for uh, reporters and photographers, uh, in that situation, it's retreat. Yeah, exactly. Right? <laughs> Don't do exactly as they say and get yeah. off his property. But I had to at least tell him, hold on, we're leaving, we're leaving, but don't shoot because yeah. it will only make matters worse. But the end result was that uh, it, it was exposed and uh, the city recovered it, money. Part of his money back. And, um, and then, uh, they had to, then they had to use that money to go out and replace these mm -hmm. dead plants and put in the right plants, the kind that we're supposed to. And this is the kind of thing that I think people, viewers, uh, look for and hope for in yeah. the media. And, and Not just that, television, but newspapers. As well. The watchdog. Exactly. And that's, it's, it's, as we used to say, shine a light in a corner, in a dark corner, mm -hmm. and expose things. And that's uh, our job. And that's one of the reasons you get into this business, mm -hmm. uh, is to do things like that, to expose stories like that. Were there uh, any mentors, or not maybe not hands-on mentors, but people that you watched on TV that you wanted to emulate, uh, reporters or anchors? Well, you know, growing up, like I said, there there were just were not a lot of black people on TV yeah. when, uh, when I was 
in junior high even and high school. Not even the network. But uh, Carol Simpson, I always uh, admired her, uh, her reporting as well as her diction. Mm -hmm. uh, my mother and I used to love watching Carol Simpson on ABC News. And locally, uh, Channel, uh, Channel 4, WTVJ in, in Miami, Miami. Uh, I had just loved Ralph Rennick. Yes, who didn't? I had a, yeah. may the good news be yours. Yeah. But uh, I just uh, admired him so much. And it, I said, you know, that's what I want to do. Mm -hmm. and, um, and at the time, we had a reporter on uh, WTVJ, C.T. Taylor. Um, one of the first black reporters in Miami, mm -hmm. um, and he was just so articulate, and I, I, I envied that, and I, I tried to emulate that, mm -hmm. uh, just uh, pronouncing words correctly. Uh, I would practice uh, diction. I sure would, you know, yeah. when no one's around, of course. But uh, I, I wanted to be like C.T. Taylor. I just thought he was so articulate, and uh, and that's uh, something I'm sure you've talk to your children about uh, it's so important. Yeah. Uh, kids in school need to really concentrate on communicating. I tell them there is absolutely nothing wrong with speaking properly. Mm -hmm. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, you, don't, you don't have to uh, speak, you know, in slang and yeah. uh, to, to be cool. It doesn't, uh, you can speak properly. It's okay. Um, and I, I tell them, I said, you know, I used to practice, I used to practice my diction, you know. Um, you know, it's not an ambulance, it's an ambulance. Uh, different, you know, different words that, you know, you hear people say around you, mm -hmm. uh, then you have to uh, take it upon yourself to say, you know what, I don't want to do that. I don't want to speak like that. I want to speak properly. What about uh, changes in the media, uh, television, radio, newspapers? Uh, that you see uh, good and mm -hmm. bad. Yeah. The good is it seems like uh, we're bringing in more uh, qualified reporters, good reporters, uh, who've had jobs in other places. Um, and I think the quality of reporting has improved. Uh, really, I think the quality of television has improved uh, tremendously. Um, here at Channel 4, though, I, 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 I just remember it being just such a strong station in terms of its reporting. Uh, the, uh, the anchors have been here forever, um, and the reporters are, are older. It seems like they, they're, they're better at their craft. But I've noticed that other stations are, are, are bringing in people who are qualified and, mm -hmm. and who, who bring a lot to the table in terms of uh, reporting and, and, and reporting skills. So that, to me, has, has changed uh, tremendously. Of course, the biggest change at uh, WJXT mm -hmm. would be the change from being a CBS affiliate to, to being an independent. That so was, you were here when that happened. That was scary. Okay, we all had smiles on our face, and we all said, you know, when they told us that this is what's going to happen, mm -hmm. uh, everybody said, yeah, yeah, yeah. Inside, I'm so sure. <laughs> I'm saying, how is this going to work? But it, it, it came about because... Um, some people got in a room and couldn't agree, and, and as a result, CBS says, well, we'll go our way. And we say, oh, well, we'll go our way. And in your and opinion, it's worked pretty well. It has, but you know, there are a number of other stations in other parts of the country where it has not worked. Really? And the reason I think it worked here was because of us, because we had a very strong news product, and that news product allowed us to maintain a certain amount of viewers. If it were not for our news product, this independence thing would not have 